Hello everybody, in unit 15 we're going to be discussing radical expressions and quadratic equations. So the first thing we need to do is discuss what is a radical. So a radical is essentially a root. You are taking, like for example, the cube root of something, the square root of something, the fourth root of some, something, etc. This is your radical symbol here. Your index tells you what type of root you're taking. So this is an example of a cube root. This is your radical symbol, and this is your radicand, and that's what you're taking the root of. Now, I do want to point out that if you just see a square root, there will never be a number written here, but that does have an understood index of 2. Keep in mind what square roots represent. That means something times itself would give you this number. So, like, if you had an index of 3, that means something times itself 3 times would give you whatever's inside the radical symbol. Now, radicals can be written as rational exponents, thus rational exponents can be written as radicals. So these two are telling you the exact same thing. So x to the a over b power, b ends up becoming your index, a is whatever exponent you're raising x to. So it gives you an example down here at the bottom, 16 to the 3 fourths power means you're taking the fourth root, so again, your denominator becomes your index. And then this is the fourth root of 16 to the third power. So that becomes your exponent here. Now this can also be written as just the fourth root of 16 and then take that whole entire answer to the third power. So if you think about it, the fourth root of 16, that's what number times itself four times would give you 16. And so the answer there would be two. And then again, you're raising that to the third power, which gives you the, answer, the final answer of eight. So let's just do an example of rewriting rational exponents as radicals. So this 8 to the 2 thirds power, again, it's almost like your fraction lays down, takes a nap, because this becomes the third root, or the cube root, excuse me, of 8, and then that's being raised to the second power. I prefer to, like, to write it this way because it's easier for me to take the cube root of 8 first. The cube root of 8 is 2 because 2 times 2 times 2 gives you 8. And then we're going to raise that answer to the second power, so that will give you a final answer of 4. And what does this mean, 5 to the 1 half? That means you're taking the square root of 5 to the first power. Now really, both this 2 here and this 1 here do not need to be written because it's understood that when you have a square root, there's a 2. And then it's also understood that anything can be raised to the first power. Now let's see if you can go the opposite direction. So if you're given a radical, could you write, rewrite it using exponents? What this means is 5 to the 3 fourths power. Again, it's all about what goes where. Your denominator is your index. Your exponent is your numerator. This is a to the 4 twelfths power. Now, could this be simplified? Yes, it can because 4 twelfths is the same thing as 1 third. We would rewrite this as 3x to the... 2 fifths power. Now notice how I wrote 3x. I wrote it in parentheses and that's very important because if I hadn't wrote it in parentheses the only thing that would have been written to that power would have been the x and not the 3. So we want to write that whole thing in parentheses here. Now this one's interesting. It could be written as a to the 6 twelfths and then b to the 6 twelfths. Another option that you could do would just be to write a b to the 6 twelfths power. That would mean the same thing as long as it's in parentheses. Now either one of these though can be reduced down. a to the 6 twelfths is the same thing as a to the 1 half and b to the 6 twelfths is the same thing as b to the 1 half. Or again you could write it as a b in parentheses being raised to the 1 half power. These two mean the exact same thing. Now we need to talk about what it means to simplify a radical. So a lot of times you have perfect squares. So a perfect square, for example, would be like the square root of 16 because 4 times 4 gives you 16 or the square root of 25 because 5 times 5 gives you 25. But what about when you have something like the square root of 27? Well, the square root of 27 is not very pretty. Um, you could put it in your calculator and get an ad a decimal approximation. I know since the square root of 25 is 5 and the square root of 36 is 6, I know that the square root of 27 is 5 point something, and I could get some uh, you know, ugly decimal approximation. Otherwise, what you can do is see if there's a perfect square that would come out of 27 so you could reduce it in radical form, which is what we're going to be talking about next. 
Now you have some options in terms of simplifying radicals. One is to look for a perfect square that would go into this number that you'd be able to take the square root of. So for example, one option of doing this problem would be rewriting this as the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. And why did I rewrite it as the square root of 9 times the square root of 2? The reason being is the square root of 9 is a pretty number. The square root of 9 is 3 because 3 times 3 is 9. So what this means is negative 8 times 3. And then you can't do anything though with the square root of 2 because the square root of 2 is not a perfect square. And so this can be written as negative 24 square root of 2. Now with one like this though, I don't actually prefer that method because trying to come up with the largest perfect square that would go into 162, you might be there for a while. So another method that I prefer to do, I'm going to show you actually with this first problem, is use a factor tree. So keep in mind what a square root means. So a factor tree, what I'm going to do is break this down as far as I can go into perfect prime numbers. So 18 can be broken down into 3 times 3 times 2. What a square root means is a pair of numbers that would multiply to give you a certain number. Once you find a pair using your factor tree, this particular number gets to come out of the radical. Whatever doesn't have a pair stays in. So notice the number 3 gets to come out of the radical and get multiplied by negative 8, so that's negative 24. 2 does not have a pair, so 2 has to stay inside the radical. So let's use that same um, concept with 162. So you can break down 162. It's really however you want to think about it. I mean, I would start probably with 2 since it's an even number. So this would be 2 times 81. 2 is prime. 81 you can break down into 9 times 9, which you could actually go back to use this method at this point. It's really up to you. But I'm just going to keep breaking it down here. 9 is going to be 3 times 3. Now I've broken this down as far as I can go. Once you find a pair of numbers, that one number here gets to come out of the radical. So what this means, by definition, I take a 3 out, I take another 3 out, the 2 is left over. So this becomes 3 times 3, which is 9 and then the square root of 2 left over. Could this same method work with a cube root? Absolutely. 54, you could do 9 and 6. 9 is going to be 3 times 3. 6 is going to be 3 times 2. The only difference with a cube root is you're not looking for a perfect square anymore, so you're not looking for a pair. You're actually looking for a group of 3 if we're talking about a cube root. So that means this number gets to come out of the radical. Keep in mind there's a negative out front, so this would be negative 3. And then you would have the cube root of 2 left over. So that is a simplified radical. So again, all of these, you're not given a decimal approximation. What you're doing is rewriting this radical by taking out perfect squares or perfect cubes. So what do you do with variables? Well, you could still use a factor tree method if you wanted to. But I really won't, I don't want you to have to draw this every single time. But think about again what a square root means. It's looking for a pair of something. So essentially you're asking yourself, when you have x to the third, well, what, how many pairs do you have? Well, you have one pair, so that means that x gets to come out of the radical. And this one doesn't have one, so it gets left over. Now, I, I don't, again, I don't want you to have to draw this every single time. So another way of thinking about this, since we're looking for pairs, is how many times will the number 2 go into the exponent? However many times 2 will go into the exponent, that's how many you take out of the radical. And then whatever your remainder is, is what's left inside the radical. So what I'm saying here is 2 goes into 3 one time with a remainder of 1 left over. Just to show you another example, what about if I had the square root of x to the 7th? Again, how many pairs can you take out of 7? 2 goes into 7 3 times, and that gives you 6. But then that means there's a remainder of 1 left over. So let's put all of this together. What does it mean to simplify this radical here? First, again, I don't care whatever method you want to use, whether you want to look for perfect squares or whether you want to use a factor tree. It is completely up to you. I like to use the factor tree just because I don't really have to think about it too much. I just got to factor and then go. This means I can take out a 3 and I can take out a 2. So 3 times 2 would give me 6. And then I would have the square root of 2 left over. Now let's talk about variables. 2 goes into 7 3 times with a remainder of 1 left over. 2 goes into 4 here evenly. It goes in there twice. No remainder. 
Two goes into three one time with a remainder of one left over. So this would be my simplified radical. Let's look at it with a cube root here. So we've got 54. I'm going to break that down. 3, 3, 3, 2. So that means, again, that a 3 can come out of the radical. And so since there's already a negative 2 out here, 3 times negative 2 would be negative 6. And then I would have the cube root of 2 left over. Now let's talk about um, your exponents here. Keep in mind, this is a cube root. So we're not saying how many times does 2 go into that number. We're saying how many times does 3 go into that number. Well, 3 will go into 5 one time with a remainder of 2 left over. 3 goes into 9 evenly. 3 goes into 9 three times, no remainder. 3 goes into 14 four times. So think about that, that gives you 12. That means there's a remainder of 2 left over. So this would be our simplified radical. Now when you add and subtract radicals, just like you have to have um, like terms when you're adding and subtracting polynomials, you have to have like radicals when you add and subtract radicals. So to give you some examples of what it means to have a like radical, 2 squared of 5 and 4 squared of 5, those could be added or subtracted because they both have the square root of 5. Treat them just like you would treat variables. 6 squared of x and negative 2 squared of x could be combined together. 3 squared of 4t and the square root of 4t could be combined together. Just like with variables, if you don't have a number out front, you can always write a 1 here or there is an understood 1 out front of your radical. Now these are considered unlike. If you have a number and a radical, those could not be added or subtracted. They have to have the same exact radical, so the square root of 6, or excuse me, the square root of x and the square root of 6x are not alike. And then this one here, square root of 2 and the square root of 3 are not alike. It's kind of like adding x's and y's. You cannot do it, so you can't add them if they have unlike radicals. So let's look at an example. This one is dealing with a cube root here. So I'm going to use that same exact um, process that we were doing a while ago because we want to first try to see if we can simplify these. If we can simplify them, then we're going to look to see at the end if there's any radicals that we could put together. So I could simplify this one as 3 cube root of 2. Now 3 doesn't go into 1, so x has to stay inside, but 3 goes into 3 one time, so I'm going to bring that outside of my radical. Now this one here, I can't do anything with the number 2, but what I can do is I can do something with my variables. So notice that 3 will go into 3 one time. So what I can do here is I can take out a y. So this is going to become 5y. Then we're going to have the cube root of 2x left over. I'm going to rewrite all these together in just a minute. And then this last one, let's simplify. We can break down 128. We could divide it by 2. So this is going to be 2 and 64. 64 would be 8 and 8. I'm going to break that down into 4 and 2. 2 and 2. Again, remember we're talking about a cube root here. So we're going to start looking for groups of 3 that we can take out. We can take out a 2 here and we can take out a 2 here. So 2 times 2, if I take out two twos, is going to give me 4. And then y, that's already out there. And then the cube root of what's left over, which is 2x. Once you reduce all of these, no, lo and behold, they all have the same radical. So we can put them together. We now have, let me see, let me write it up here, 3y cube root of 2x minus 5y cube root of 2x, and then plus 4y cube root of 2x. So 5 minus 3 would give you negative 2. Negative 2 plus 4 would give you a final answer of 2y cube root of 2x.